A few weeks ago, I told you a story about, about nailing a piece of paper that I had drawn on to my bedroom wall when I was about five years old. And I, I, to be quite honest, I can't even remember what the purpose of the, the illustration was. I know it tied into my, my message. But that story really typified something about my life. I know I have certain skills in certain areas, but friends, I am not a handyman. I mean, that nailing a piece of paper into a wall is about as handy as I get. And, and so, you know, in our, in our early years of being married, we, we rent, rented places, and so any other repairs that were done were done by our landlord. And then we moved to Port Hope and owned our first house. Our first house, we, we loved it, uh, but it had some areas that needed, to, needed some repair. We needed to replace our garage. We needed to re- replace our side door. We needed to we tear out the carpet and put some laminate flooring in. We just had all these different projects. And, and I remember the first time that I had a project that needed to be done. When I, I, would, I'd call, I called one of my friends who I knew was pretty handy, and, and I asked if he could come over and help me help me. Uh, I was going to help him. Uh, but I asked if he could help me with the project. And so the individual came over. I, I presented what the project task was. He said, oh yeah, th- this won't be very difficult. And so we, we, we began to start on the project. And then he would say to me, hey, do you have any tools? I said, oh yeah, yeah, no problem. And I'd go to my basement and I would pull out the tools I had and they consisted of a hammer and a flathead screwdriver. Now, th- this isn't a flathead. I asked Pastor Nick to get me a flathead, but he doesn't know what a flathead is, so, so he, he obviously has the same story as me. Uh, but, but, I had, but I had a hammer and a, and a flathead screwdriver, and I, I figured that's all you needed. You just need something to, to screw things in and nail things into the wall. Remember the picture when I was in the, uh, five years old? And, and my, my friend would just look at me, and he realized that the, the tools that were required to do the job were not in my possession. That that flathead and the and the hammer weren't going to do it. That we needed some more tools, and so often my friend would end up having to go back home and get his tools. And eventually, it came to a place where, where when we had a project, I would call one of my two friends, my friend Dominic or my friend Jeremy, and, and I'd invite them over to help me with my project. And and Ainsley would would say something like, "Do you have the right tools?" And I was like, "No problem. My friend has the tools." Dominic has all the tools that I need. Jer has all the tools that I need. And I was always confident we were able to get the task done because I was completely reliant upon what my friends were bringing to the equation. Now friends, the reason why I share that is because we all understand that we have a calling in our lives to do something for Jesus. We all understand Matthew 28, 19, and 20, that is to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing and teaching. We understand that. But I don't know about you, but there are times in my life I just don't feel I have all the tools to do that. Uh, And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but the conversations I have on a regular basis, people understand what the task is. They understand the project. They just feel that, that in their lives they just have a hammer and a flathead screwdriver. They, they just don't have enough. It's interesting, if you look up at the screen, there's this verse that we find in the Gospels. And Jesus, is, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says this, But in fact, it's best for you to go away, because if I don't, it's best, if, it is best for you, I missed a word there. It is best for you, for me to go away, because if I don't, the advocate w- won't come. If I do go away, I will send him to you. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and I mean, he's in the prime of his ministry. And he, he, he disturbs them with this statement saying, hey, it's best for me to go away. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, Jesus. You, I mean, we just kind of left everything, joined up with you. We're, we're seeing some great success. We're seeing some great growth. Why would you leave right now? But he says this. He says, even though I'm going to prepare you so well, even though you're going to be ready to do so much, I want you to know that you're not going to have enough tools in your belt to do the mission unless I send the Spirit of God. You're going you're gonna to understand about teaching. You're, you're going to understand some, about some of the miraculous. I'm going to send you out in, in pairs. 72 people will be sent out in pairs. You're going to understand a whole lot. You will, you will be pastored by, by an individual who's better than any pastor that's ever existed or ever will, me, Jesus. But boys, you need to know that it's better for me to go away because there's a tool that you need to fulfill your mission. And it's called the Holy Spirit. 
And we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that Jesus reminds the disciples after three and a half years of ministering with them, three and a half years of, 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 of being their tutor, three and a half years of being trained by Jesus, that they are almost qualified. They're almost ready to go. But if they're going to accomplish Matthew 28, 19, and 20, there's just something that's missing. There's something beyond the hammer and the flat head they have in their hands. There's something called the person of the Holy Spirit. And they need the empowerment of the Spirit of God to fulfill the mission. And Jesus says to them in, Matthew chap or in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, don't leave Jerusalem until you get the next tool, until you get what you need. You see, he understands that we need the Holy Spirit. We need the empowerment of the Spirit of God to accomplish our mission. And that's why our second core value here at CPC is empowered living. We rely on the Holy Spirit. This church believes in empowered living. I, I'm, I'm going to say this unapologetically. I, I know there are people from all different backgrounds, different denominations, and we love you, and we, you are as much a part of our family as the next. But at the core of who this church is, is a church that truly believes that the Spirit of God empowers us to fulfill the mission at the core of who this church has always been. We believe in relying fully on the Holy Spirit. We know about our giftings. We know about our efforts and our hard work. But at the core of who we are at CPC is this, this realization that we just don't have all the tools of ourselves to make the mission happen. And that's why we are so dependent upon the Holy Spirit. We rely upon him. We believe in empowered living. And so I want to take you to Acts chapter 4. And I want to show you something very incredible and just very briefly talk to you about what this looks like, empowered living. It says this, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the, the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this happened here in this very city. For Herod, Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles and the people of Israel will, were all united against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed. Now let's just pause here for a second. This first part of the prayer is important because the disciples, Peter and John, have just been arrested for, for bringing a healing in the city for a crippled man at Solomon's colonnade. And, and they get arrested and the Sanhedrin pulled them together, the ruling religious class, and they're, they're telling them that they can't preach Jesus anymore. And, and so the beginning of this prayer is like, man... God, it's like, it's like history is, is on repeat. The people are always pushing against the message of God. They're always pushing against you. And so they start the prayer of this. And then we continue on and it says this. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, now, this is what's important. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. With boldness. I, I love this story because you, you have some disciples who are pretty bold. P Peter, in fact. Peter's gone from this, this quivering wimp that sat by a fire and didn't even have the guts to stand up to a young girl to say that he was a follower of Jesus. I mean, this coward, yellow belly Peter to this man who stands up in the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people get saved. We have this Peter who, who has just confronted the Sanhedrin and they've said, hey, don't, don't you preach anymore about Jesus. And he basically says, hey, we need you to understand that we don't listen to men. We, we don't seek the approval of men. We seek the approval of God. So we're, we're going to keep going. And then he comes back, and it's almost like there's this fear in his heart because they begin to pray this prayer like, hey, God, we, we've been threatened. It's like, like it always happens. We 
realize we don't have what it takes to get the mission done. We've just been told that the mission's over. We don't have what it takes, and so we just need you to do some things. And then we're going to look at the things that they asked for. We, Holy Spirit, we're relying upon you. And Jesus responds to their prayer by sending the Spirit of God and empowering them again for living. And after the Spirit of God comes, because they're so reliant upon him, they go forth and preach the Word of God boldly again. That's the context. We see a group of disciples who are fully reliant upon the Holy Spirit. So what are they reliant on? First of all, they're reliant on the Holy Spirit for confidence to share Jesus' story. Confidence. Peter says, enable your servants to speak with boldness. I, I mean, this is Peter, like who I just said, who, just, who, who was able to stand before the 3,000. This is Peter who's just still, stood before the religious rulers of the day. And it seems like he's, he's full of confidence, but, but the truth is, is there's something inside of him because he knows he's been threatened, and we don't know what that threat was all about, but per, perhaps it was that he would be ostracized in the community. Perhaps it was that he would be beaten. Most likely, it was all about peer pressure, that he would be pushed to the margins of society, and his family would reject him, and, and his friends would reject him, and they would do everything to ostracize him. And in this moment, Rather than being courageous, he prays this prayer. He says, we need you to enable us. Holy Spirit, we're so reliant upon you. We need you to enable us to be bold so we can go forth and share your story. Share the story of Jesus Christ. Friends, I don't know about you, but I feel like Peter sometimes. There are moments where I'm incredibly confident. And then there's moments where I am scared. Anybody, anybody who's... Honest like me, like, is there, I, I know you're all bold and radical, and, but is there anybody out there besides me who just has these moments where you go like, I'm just freaked out about sharing my faith. Anybody? Okay, there's about 25 of us. Sorry, that's great. So for, let me just preach to you for a few moments. There are, there are just moments I'm very confident, but there's moments where I get in situations where I think if I step over the line and share my faith, that I'm, I'm in trouble, I'm going to be ostracized by this person, it's going to sever the relationship, this is going to be a bad moment. I remember living in Port Hope, and there was this, this neighbor, I used to call her Mrs. Roper. I don't know if you remember Three's Company. Those of you who are younger won't know who Mrs. Roper is, but she just seemed to be that person who always wanted to know what was going on. So I, I don't remember what her name was, but I called her Mrs. Roper. And, and, and her husband and I had a, a pretty good relationship. Her daughter was amazing, a, a younger teenager, or sorry, an older teenager. But Mrs. Roper, some days she would talk her ear off, and some days she wouldn't even say hi to us. I just never knew what I was going to get. And this one day, I was coming into the house, and I saw Mrs. Roper, and, and I, I said, hey, how's it going? And it was one of these moments, you, you know, you ask people, how's it going, and you don't really want to know, but it's just a polite thing to do. It was one of those moments. I wasn't really concerned about what she was going to say, but she unfolded everything that was in her heart, and she began to talk about this, I can't remember the situation, but this terrible stuff that she's going to, and she's in tears. I mean, this is the lady who sometimes doesn't even say hi to me. And I'm there, and in my mind, I think to myself, this is my God moment. And then, and then this other voice in my head says, shut up, Jeff. You don't, you don't want to be over-spiritual. You, you, you don't want to offend her, and all these things. And so this fear kind of gripped my heart. And so I, didn't, I was like, oh, that's bad. Well, well, we'll be praying for you. And she just like... And I start to walk towards the house, and Ainsley kind of leans into me, and she goes, Hey, pastor, why don't you pray for her now? <laughs> I'm thinking, why don't you pray for her? Like, why me? But the pastor part was the, <laughs> was the reason why. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I thought to myself, okay, she's right. I probably should do this. And, and so I, I went, and I said, hey, listen, we will pray for you, but would it be okay if I pray for you right now? And she went, no, I'm just not prepared for that. And she walks in the door. I mean, you were looking for a good story, right? <laughs> That's the stories that freak me out. That if I actually step out, I'm going to have someone go, no, don't tell me about Jesus. Don't, don't, don't pray for me. Don't, don't. Those are the stories that permeate my mind in those moments where I know the, the mission, I know the project, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm so intimidated by the rejection and the what ifs. 
And that's what was in the hearts of the disciples. They knew what they were supposed to do. But there's just this moment they've been threatened. And I think every single one of us in this church understands the Matthew 28, 19, and 20 principle. I can't believe in my heart there would be anybody in this place that would desire to see a friend or a loved one go to hell. We understand the mission, but it's fear that gripples, uh, grips our heart. I've shared this before, but it's just, it has to be shared again. When I was 15, I was at a youth convention. I was in, I was in the, the fear stage. I, I, I was full of faith, but would never share my faith with my friends. I, I, was so, I was so freaked out about what would happen and being ostracized at school. And occasionally, uh, occasionally, because people knew I was a Christian, I, it would, I would be forced to share. But, but I would never initiate it. I found myself at Jock Hardy Arena in Kingston, Ontario at a youth convention on the Saturday night. And I, and I prayed for the Holy Spirit's empowering. This empowered living. And I remember, I remember standing there looking up at the white stucco ceiling with my hands raised. And I began to call out in the Holy Spirit. I understood that the sign that we see all through Acts, just in case some of you are wondering. Every time that we see the Spirit of God being poured out in Acts, we see that the way they knew was because they spoke in tongues. I knew that that was there. I was freaked out about that. I didn't want to speak in a language I didn't understand. But I was so hungry for the empowering. I was so reliant on the Holy Spirit. And something happened in that arena where the Spirit of God came down, filled me, and I began to speak in a language that I didn't understand. And if you're here and you're new and, uh, and that sounds really weird, it is weird. Because the things of God are so beyond the normal. But it was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever faced in my life. And for the next, I don't know how long it was, I spoke in tongues and, and it was, I felt the Spirit of God, His power in my life like never before. Came to the end of that service. Service ends, I walk out. And all of a sudden, this light bulb had come on inside of my life. I've shared this before, but it's so worth sharing again that, that I just was so frustrated because there were all these Christians at this convention and my heart was yelling, I need to tell someone about Jesus. I don't understand what took place inside between the, the, the kid who came into the service before that moment who was freaked out about sharing his faith and the moment that the, the, the Spirit empowered me, I walked out and this desire to tell people about Jesus. But I can tell you it was real. Something changed in my life that I was so eager to share the story of Jesus with other people. That's why we hear Paul saying, in one of his epistles, be filled with the Spirit. And it's not this one-time deal, it's this ongoing thing. Hey, Peter's already filled with the Spirit, Acts chapter 2, but Acts chapter 4, he, the Spirit gets poured out again because there's this daily reliance upon the Spirit's empowering, friends. This day, you, you may have been filled with the Spirit once in your life, but this church is not a, a one-time pony show. I don't even know if that's a, a thing. But this is not, this is not a one-time deal. We are a church that relies on the Spirit of God day after day after day after day. We are re relying on His power because the truth is I don't have enough courage in who I am to do the mission. And neither do you. Because I'm a loudmouth extrovert. And if I can't do it, probably you can't either. We need His empowering. Some of you, you remember when you were a kid. And you did something wrong, and you had to go tell an adult that you had done it. And your mom's like, get over there and tell that person. And you're staring at this adult like they are the, this three-headed monster. And you are shaking in your boots. And I don't know about you, but I, I would say to my mom or my dad, could you come with me? Could you come with me? And they'd, they'd smile and go, okay. And I'd hold my mom's hand, and I'd walk over. I, I broke, I broke your whatever it was. I, and I, I was nervous, but there was this confidence that the person beside me was going to help me in the situation. Jesus was saying that. It's better that I go so the Spirit of God will come to hold your hand in every fearful situation. Give you the power that you need to share the story of Jesus. This is a church that believes in the empowering of the Holy Spirit so that we might share Jesus' story. Number two, not only, not only do we have this reliance upon the Holy Spirit to share Jesus' story, but we have this reliance on the Holy Spirit for the ability to continue Jesus' mission. The ability to continue Jesus' mission. Not to share his story, but continue his mission. 
the disciples pray, stretch out your hand to heal. Now, friends, many of you probably think about healing in a peripheral way. That healing is the thing we do on communion Sundays. Healing is the thing we do when we have a healing evangelist in. Healing is something that rarely takes place. But healing was core to Jesus' ministry. Look, look at the screen, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This is kind of Jesus' mission statement. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Man, I'm missing all kinds of words today on the, in these, these, these slides. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free. This is his mission. This is why he's there. The disciples grab hold of this word heal. It's part of the mission. Jesus is there to touch the poor. He's there to touch the blind. He's there to, touch, to bring healing. He's there to go after the oppressed. You see, Jesus' mission was to bring life into dead situations. You, you need to understand this. His mission on planet Earth, everywhere he went, he breathed life into dead situations. Those, those who were poor, he breathed life into them. Those who were blind, he breathed life and they got their sight back. Those who were prisoners, he breathed life in them. And even though their situation may not have changed, the inside they were free. He came and the oppressed, he breathed life into them. Our calling as a church is not simply to come here on Sunday mornings, friends. I want you to understand this. I so appreciate the fact you come here on Sunday because it's great to preach to a group of people like you. The bigger the crowd makes me feel better. I enjoy I get energized by the crowd. But that's not what you're here for. Your Christianity isn't just about attending Sunday mornings. Your job, your mission is to continue Jesus' mission. That's what you're here for. Please understand, if you think that your job is simply to get to church and get your kids to church, you miss the whole story completely. Your job as a Christian is to carry on his mission. And his mission was to breathe life into dead situations. To breathe life into dead situations. I remember being at Ottawa Valley Pentecostal Camp. They're in the middle of family camp right now. And, and uh, just thinking about, just talking to a couple of our people who were down there this week and just thankful for what God's doing there. But... I was there when I was, when I was early in my years as a youth pastor. We had this speaker in Carlos Sarmiento. It was Benny Hinn's youth pastor. And I remember he, he, would, he shared in a number of services very prophetically. He, he would speak things over our life that, that I, I could never believe that he would understand, things that he would know, things that were secret if he spoke things that seemed like to come from heaven's blueprint room. And we sat down with him one night, and we asked him about how, how he got to that place of being able to speak such life into people. And he talked about finding a safe place, a place where he could, we could practice, where you weren't going to be ridiculed, where you could listen to the voice of God and take a step out and speak it. And then he talked about the importance of, of taking those risks because you love people. This is key. Jesus' mission is always based upon love. John three sixteen for God so loved the world. And when it comes to fulfilling the supernatural elements of his mission, it, some of us just get freaked out by it, but, but it's the love part. That when, he would, when Carlos would step into a situation, he'd pray for a heart of love, and the people he's ministering, he knew that if his heart was full of love, that he would dispense things from heaven that would breathe life into dead situations. And so I started to think about that, and I had, I had been traveling. I was only new into ministry, but I had been traveling a bit as a, as a speaker, had done some retreats and, and some events, had gone well, had seen the Holy Spirit move, but I wasn't used to the gifts of the Spirit that would allow me to breathe life into dead situations. And so I started to think to myself, Holy Spirit, I need more than just good communication skills. I need more than just good stories. I need to rely upon you to breathe life into the people I'm ministering to. So I start to try it. I start showing up at, at speaking engagements, and I would pray, Holy Spirit, give me a heart for these people. Let me love these people. And let me breathe life into their, their dead situations. And so I'd come up to somebody at the altar, and I'd place my hands on their shoulder, and before I'd ever say a word, I'd say, Holy Spirit, the reliance, right? Holy Spirit, is there anything that I can share to breathe life into this person? And all of a sudden, a picture would come to my mind. And I would speak into the person and say, hey, I, I got this picture. And as I was sharing it, the Holy Spirit would start to download. I'd start to hear these things in my head, say, hey, say this, say this. And as I would begin to share these things I had no idea about, all of a sudden, the person would start to cry. And person after person would tell me, 
the life that God was breathing into their dead situations. That's the mission of God, the continued mission. I remember this one church, I preached on the Sunday morning, and, uh, and I was doing both the morning and the evening. It was in Pembroke. It wasn't a Pentecostal church. I finished preaching on the Sunday morning, and I was like, wow, that was less eventful than I thought it was going to be. I'm not really excited about coming here this evening. Uh, well, uh, anyway, so I, I went home, and, uh, you know, it was okay, but not dynamic. And I sat downstairs. It was fall, so I was watching football, which is what I do in the fall, and, and watching on TV. And, and then the Spirit of God just kind of stirs my heart says, you need to get ready for the service. You need to breathe life into them. No more than your message, you need to start to breathe life into them because that's the mission of Jesus, to breathe life into dead things. I, I mean, we were once dead in our sins, and he breathed life into us by the cross. The mission of Jesus is to breathe life into things. Healing is about breathing life into dead physical things. We, we, we bring prophetic words because we breathe life into dead emotional things. Breathe life. And that night I, I got to the church. I had been praying that God would use me. And there was a church of about 100 people. That is, it's the, probably the most exhausting service I'd ever been in. Person after person, I just placed my hand on them and said, God, what do you want to say? What do you want to say? And person after person, God dropped something into my heart. The Holy Spirit spoke something to, into me. And that church walked away so full of life. Some of them had come in so dead, but God breathed life into them. And when the disciples pray, stretch out your hand to heal, they only capture one element of Jesus' mission in Luke 4, verse 18. But it's part of the overall mission that as a church, we're not just to exist here on Sundays, but God's called you into your workplace, into your neighborhood, into the Starbucks or Tim Hortons for the, the rest of you. He's called you wherever you go to listen to the Holy Spirit and extend his mission. To extend his mission. Friends, listen, listen, some of you, teenagers, listen, some of you think, man, Christianity is not that exciting, but what happens if you become so reliant upon the Spirit of God that everywhere you go, you simply say to him, Holy Spirit, is there a way for me to breathe life into a dead situation here? Is there a way, is there a way for me to breathe life into a coworker? Is there a way for me to breathe life into a neighbor? Extend your hand and heal. Heal physical. Heal emotional. Heal marriages. Would you let me be an extension of your mission? And so the disciples were relying upon the Holy Spirit for the fulfillment of Jesus' mission. Lastly, they were relying upon the, the Holy Spirit for power to reveal Jesus' kingdom. Power to share his message, to continue his mission, but they also want to reveal his kingdom. Listen to this. They pray, do signs and wonders. Now, we're, we're a Pentecostal church, part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And for years, we were known as a church, I don't mean CPC in general, but Pentecostal churches were known as churches that had signs and wonders. Then we got all nice. <laughs> I mean, me too. We, we, we got very well accepted in society. I, I won't give you the history of the evangelical world, but there was a moment where we were, we were ostracized, but we saw signs and wonders. It was part of the Pentecostal realm. And then we, then we want greater acceptance through the Evangelical World Fellowship of the Church's Council or something like that. I'm missing the exact name. And, and we got to a place where we became more and more accepted, and we saw less and less signs and wonders, at least here in North America. Pentecostalism everywhere else in the world is seeing signs and wonders all the time. They, they see the extension of God's kingdom. But signs and wonders, signs are a supernatural element to authenticate the message. The disciples were used to this. The early church in 1906, when the Spirit of God got poured out in North America, they, they were used to this. There would be signs that would authenticate the message of Jesus that they were sharing. Then the word wonders is the supernatural element that provides an earthly glimpse into heaven. Earthly glimpse. They were relying on the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus' kingdom to this world. The signs they wanted to prove that Jesus' kingship would authenticate the word. I, I've told the story about the, the young man I, that was in a service when I was preaching in Texas a number of years ago. He had cancer in his wrist, and, and so they had removed the cancer, and they had, he had to, uh, the, the, all his tendons were, were cut, and so he wasn't able to bend his wrist. Like it was physically impossible to bend his wrist. Uh, there was no way. And, and the youth director pulls me aside after the service and says, Jeff, you've got to meet this kid. And his kid was 19 years old, so pulls him aside tells a story about the cancer in his wrist and how they had, had done the surgery and wasn't able to bend his wrist. And Marty says, hey, 
Show, show Jeff what happened. He says, while I was in the middle of worship, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit came upon me. Watch this, Jeff. Starts to do this. Starts to move his... Physically impossible. It's a sign. You know why? Because when that kid goes to the doctors and he shows the doctor what the med- medical charts say isn't possible, it authenticates the mission of Jesus. It, it, also, it also tells the doctors that Jesus has authority over things that the medical world doesn't have authority over. This is a church that believes in that. That Jesus does signs today. That he has the ability to confound the minds of people and say to them, my rulership is greater than anything that you have. His kingdom. And then the wonders. Wonders. We read in the very following chapter after they pray this prayer, Ananias and Sapphira sell some land. And and they bring just a portion. It's like tithes and offerings. Ushers come forward and, and they say, hey, hey, Peter, we, we've, we've, bought some, we've bought some land. We're going to give you the money. And, and Ananias, he, he puts the money in. Is that is what, what you got? And the Holy Spirit strikes him down. I, I would love that to happen in offering time. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I, I don't want anybody here to die. <laughs> but, but, I mean, can you imagine... Time to, time to take tithes and offerings. And people start falling over dead. I mean, the, either it's going to draw a lot of people or people are like, we're not going to that church anymore. <laughs> the church is amazed at this wonder. Sapphira comes in a number of hours later, doesn't know what's happened to her husband. Gets confronted, hey, did you sell the land for this price? Is, this, is it the money that you've given, is this the, the full amount? She lies to the Holy Spirit. She lies to the disciple. She lies to the Holy Spirit. And then the response back is, you lied not just to me, but to the Holy Spirit. And she struck down dead. Two people in one day. Great ministry. What does the Bible say in Acts chapter 5? Wonder and fear filled the church. Wonder. People's mouths were left open because of this, this supernatural element that took place. The, the heavenly realm coming down to the earthly realm. And I think, friends, that there is something more than us doing professional church and living professional Christianity. Every Sunday morning, we, we gather to, to pray. I often will pray in my office and then come out around 10 after. Sometimes we'll be praying out here. And the prayer is, is that the Holy Spirit would do wonders here. That would leave people with their jaws dropped because they can't deny that heaven's touching earth. They can't deny that, that, that God's in the room. I've talked to a few people over the last few weeks, and they've told me stories about inviting people who, who come into our service, and they begin to cry. It's not because, I, because of my bad preaching or because Pastor Steve sings too loud. It's not that. Not that he does or that I'm a bad preacher. Anyways, but they're crying because they don't understand the presence of God. People coming in, and, and they're just overwhelmed. They go, I don't understand what's here. They're left in awe. We pray that the wonder of God would show up, the signs and wonders that would leave people perplexed and tasting heaven. You see, friends, I, I want to do things excellently here. You're going to hear about that in our in value number nine, excellence and, uh, and creativity. And we're going to do everything with all our ability, but we rely on the Holy Spirit because we know that even if we have the excellence and the creativity, it's not enough to change people's lives. We rely upon the Holy Spirit with signs and wonders that will show them a little bit of what heaven looks like. A little bit of his kingdom. You see, you're not, you're not just somebody who's squeaking into heaven. You're called to carry the kingdom of God wherever you go to reveal it. Pastor, I can't do that. No, you can't. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. That's why you need him. Last story. Pastor Steve, would you come back? Jess, would you come back? I, I, I had, a, I had a, a young man in our, our youth ministry. He, he went on to become a worship pastor at, at the embassy in Oshawa. His name was Matt Robinson, and, and Matt was very gifted music, is very gifted musically. And he, was, he, he decided to take a year off of uh, school, and, and he worked with me. And so I gave him the opportunity to preach one night. Friends, I got to tell you, I, I understand what it's like when, when you're green when it comes to preaching. I was there. Matt preached that night, and it was not good. I mean, Matt's just, a, he's one of the funniest people I know, and, and he's confident, but it was funny, but it just, it wasn't really good. And, and, I, and I'm like, I'm trying to think about how I'm going to save the service. 
how I'm going to how I'm going to rectify the problem we have with the bad communicator. And Matt gives a salvation message. And in my mind I'm thinking to myself, nobody's getting saved. I mean my my faith level is like below the stage. I mean it's just bad. And and you know, you know the the, the line everybody close your eyes, no one peeking. I I I did what everybody in this place does on Sunday mornings when I say that. I was you know, I'm I'm peeking. <laughs> And I'm expecting no one to raise their hands, but kid after kid after kid raised their hands to give their lives to Jesus. Something happened in my heart that moment because I realized this, that it's not just our skill. It's not just our, our, the tools that we have in our, in our hands. That if I rely upon the Holy Spirit, He can do things that don't even make sense. I mean, kids can get saved even when a bad message takes place. That in your trembling with your neighbor, in that moment where you ask the neighbor if you can pray for them and they say no, in the moment you're at Starbucks and the Spirit drops something into your heart, that if you would rely upon the Spirit of God, that you could just drop your tools and let Him go to town. Let Him work. And friends, that is this church. That's who we are. That's core to who we are. We rely upon the Holy Spirit empowered living. I want you to stand for a moment. We're going we're gonna to do just a couple things. I know it's 11.59. I'm asking for you just to be gracious for five minutes. Pastor Steve's going to lead us in one song. And all we're going to do after that is we're going to just raise our hands. And I'll, I'll direct it in just a moment. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit just to fill this place. Because we need to be a church, the core of who we are, that's relying upon Him to share his story, to, to demonstrate his kingdom and, and the power of his kingdom and the ability to fulfill his mission, bring life into dead situations. So Pastor Steve, lead us in this song and then we're going to pray. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close 